Okay, let's begin. Uh, thank you again for your patience. Uh, as Dr. Arnold said, we're really glad that there's this much interest in the scrolls. There are a lot of stories to tell when you cover the scrolls, and I'm going to try to do it in an hour or so. The main thing I'm going to do is a pretty serious presentation of the new materials. That's why you've got some handouts with Hebrew uh, transliterations and translations. Because I didn't want this just to be something you could go get in a book. Uh, you know, there are dozens of books out on the scrolls at libraries and bookstores. So at least half of what we're going to do is serious scholarly work where I want to show you some pretty interesting things, I think, that you will find fascinating. But I feel like it would be uh, uh, unwise to just dive right into that without saying something about two other stories that are related to the new materials. One is a little bit about uh, why it has been uh, over 40 years uh, to get them all out. A few just clarifications about that. Who's to blame, who's not to blame. Many wild rumors going around. And particularly uh, the rumor that the, the Jews or the Israelis did not want them out, which is absolutely untrue. I want to clarify a couple things. Second story will be with slides. Now, some of you might not be able to see them real well, uh, but uh, I'll try to explain as I go. Uh, I'm just sorry about that. But uh, actually, what I'm going to show as slides is minimal. I just think we shouldn't talk about this area without looking at it a little bit. And I want to create, really, from the slides more than anything, a certain atmosphere. I want to take you to the wilderness of Judea and let you think about that voice crying in the wilderness, prepare you the way of the Lord, which is uh, the reason these people were out there in the first place. So let me, this is almost a preliminary. We're going to talk about the new text. Let me say something about uh, why it was that until November uh, the 20th of last year, you could not get your hands on all of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, a clarification or two. Most of the major scrolls from Cave 1, there are 11 caves that were discovered with scroll material. There are hundreds of caves in the area, but only 11 have yielded what we call scroll material. That could even be a scrap. But Now, the major scrolls were bought uh, in various ways in a thrilling story that you should read in a book, or one of the books on the scrolls. Like you could get, uh, even Allegro's old book tells that story pretty well, or Vermish's book. But anyway, they were bought by the Israelis. Uh, really clandestine operations, uh, interesting, where uh, agents in New York bought them under an assumed name and they got back to Israel. So by the early 50s, the major scrolls from Cave One were out and published. That's no controversy. That's why everybody tended to forget about the Dead Sea Scrolls. So then for about 10 or 15 years, scholars argued over all those. That is, we had the so-called Damascus document. Actually, we had had that even earlier. We had the Manual of Discipline. We had the Great Isaiah Scroll. How many of you have been to Israel and actually seen that? So you know that's no secret. Uh, you know, it's on display. So the major scrolls, finally the Temple Scroll uh, uh, didn't come out. I think I've got a date on that. Let's see. Yadin got that a little late. That came out when 67 actually was announced, and I think he published it very quickly. So I just want to say this because people misunderstand some things. These are religious sens sensitivities people have. The Israelis have been the best in putting out the scrolls, if you're talking about religious groups or, secular or uh, cultural groups. Everything the Israelis have had, they, under their control, they have put out immediately. Uh, Yadin published his material within two years. <clears throat> so we're glad for that. Uh, so we don't want any uh, Jew bashing. You know, sometimes people say, oh, the Jews don't want the scrolls out. Well, that's just not the right story. And we don't want Catholic bashing either, because that's the other kind of prejudiced alternative. What happened is that the majority of the scrolls we're really interested in are from K4. I'll show you pictures of that. That's the one that you all see if you've been to Qumran perhaps scraps of up to 800 rolls or scrolls. Now, not the whole scrolls, but different scraps would indicate a library, let's say, of 800 volumes in one cave. But they were shredded and hopelessly jumbled into over 
50,000 to 75,000 fragments, depending on how you want to count fragments. Now, if you've seen the photographs yet, you know that the photographs, some of those photographs uh, just look like little teeny giblets of paper, completely unreadable. But not all of them. Then you'll turn to a page, and here's a beautiful text. Very readable, perfectly preserved. Those weren't out either, you see, until uh, last year. Now, what happened? Well, there was a team of scholars, and it was under the control of the Jordanians. Remember, this was Jor under the jurisdiction of the Hashemite kingdom of Jordan when they were discovered in the 40s. There was no state of Israel, right? And about the time the state of Israel was coming to birth, the scrolls were discovered. So it's sort of a twin renaissance of the Jewish people in their homeland as well as uh, their most ancient texts. So that was an interesting phenomenon. Now, the Jordanians had all of the material uh, in the Rockefeller Museum, which was back then called the Palestinian Archaeological uh, Museum, PAM. You'll see that on some of your sheets. PAM number 43 point, that means that those numbers go all the way back to when they were first photographed, uh, just to identify them. Now, a team of scholars worked on those. We call it the international team. But in the early days, it was a pretty close shop. It tended to be a, a very small group of eight or ten scholars, all connected with the Ecole Biblique, uh, most of them Roman Catholic, I think two non-Catholics, let's just say Christian, no Jews, and frankly, no Jews allowed in this case because there were very harsh feelings. You've got to remember, we're talking about the 40s, the 50s, the 60s. Uh, there wasn't a lot of friendliness sometimes between these governments, right? And, and that affected the scholarly world as well. What happened, though, when the Israelis took Jerusalem in 1967, remember the Six-Day War in June, by right of conquest, I guess you could say, they suddenly own the uh, Palestinian Museum because it's in East Jerusalem, or they control it. They don't really own it. And it, by then, it had been changed to the Rockefeller Museum. Some of you have been there. And they, not wanting to rock the boat so much, basically left the team intact, just as they left the shrines of the mosque, uh, uh, you know, the al Aska Mosque in the dome. They put it in Arab hands because the Israelis were very sensitive about conquering Jerusalem. They were very determined to stay there, but they didn't want to come in and just say, okay, all Arabs out, the scrolls are ours, whoever was working on them, we're taking them. So that was the problem. They, it, 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 it's similar to the way they gave back the, the uh, temple area to Muslim control. There was a feeling, we're going to stay here, and this is our capital, and Jerusalem was annexed as officially a part of the state of Israel, but we will let all groups have freedom, Everything that was going on before will basically let it still go on. That affected the scrolls. So the team stayed in control. Now that means that up to, let's say, 40% of the scrolls had still not been published, and the team was working on them. Now volumes did begin to come out through the 50s and 60s. There have been about eight volumes published beyond those ones I was talking about that the Israelis brought out right away. And there's some very interesting material in those. Sometimes people. Now that we have the new material, it's causing a lot of scholars to go back and look at the so-called old material. Like uh, they've been out, people say, I want to know about the scrolls. Well, here, this is most of the material in English. Uh, in Vermish is one editor, V-E-R-M-E-S, or Gaster, you got your choice, two translations of most of the material. This is well worth looking at again in the light of the new scrolls. But these have been out for 10, 20 years. It's just people lost interest in them. When I was in graduate school, in the 1970s uh, at Chicago, nobody was interested in the Dead Sea Scrolls. The idea was, oh, that was back in the 50s. We read all of them. The scrolls were pre-Christian, Essene. You all heard it if you kept up with biblical studies. And that was it. You know, kind of interesting, but uh, not too interesting. Now, with some of the new material coming out, there's been a tremendous revival and a great interest witnessed the crowd today. If we'd given this lecture in 1955, we'd probably have five people here uh, because the Dead Sea Scrolls had, uh, actually maybe in the 50s there was still, but by the 60s there wasn't a lot of interest, 70s no interest. But some of the scholars who were working on the material, who were outside of the official team, began to agitate the chief one being the infamous Robert Eisenman of Long Beach State University. 
He, he said, I'm working on the Damascus document. You people have had copies of it for 35 years. I can't see it. I'm not even going to live to see it. And I'm mad as hell. And I want it. You know, that's the kind of attitude. And so he tried to do lawsuits. And he went over there and so forth. And the attitude of the International Committee was basically, look, you'll see it when you see it. And if you remember, some of the quotes last year were almost worse than that. Like, you probably won't live to see the material. <laughs> now, the public really, because of the campaign of Herschel Shanks, who's the editor of Biblical Archaeology Review, which many of you probably take. And if you don't take it, I would, I would say uh, start buying copies and get a subscription to BAR, Biblical Archaeology Review because they're going to be keeping up probably as good as anyone for the public level, not the most technical level, with all the new developments and new materials coming out. I've got two articles coming out with them right now, just in a backlog on these, uh, one of them on the one we're going to do today. So uh, you might remember that was last year and the year before. Big campaign, it, made, it started making the New York Times, and people started saying, wait, I didn't know that 40% of the Dead Sea Scrolls weren't out yet. Why aren't they out? And the public began to get behind it. And that's when the Huntington Library last November announced that they would let all their photographs out to any scholar. But at the same time, Eisenman uh, was only known to a few of us. And he still hasn't told where he got them. And he doesn't really want to because of legal reasons, although now it's probably blown over. But he had a, got a set of all the photographs. Uh, and then the Claremont School also announced that they would allow theirs, and it was just open, and basically everybody's happy now. I mean, there's some grudges, but the point is you can have them, I can have them, they, everybody can have them. And we had a big meeting. Uh, I don't know if you were there, Joe, at the SBL in Missouri. Did you go to that? But basically we all kissed and made up. Everybody clapped and said, oh, they're all out, and we'll never do that again. And in the future, we have a new document saying if anything's found, it'll be handled right. And I think there's a five-year clause now that it has to be out in five years or it goes back to some other committee. Kind of an international agreement among scholars. So in the future, it'll be better. But that means that we do have quite a lag on what is in that new material. That is, there are a thousand, there's about a, uh, maybe 2,500, maybe 2,000 photographs that the team has had for some time now, but the public hasn't had and other scholars haven't had. And now anybody can have them. You can even buy them from Bar if you read a little Hebrew and want to start playing around with it. You can have your own copy of the unpublished scrolls. Now, so that's really the story. And I, I wanted to start with that because there's so many rumors going around and who's to blame and who's not to blame. Some people feel more bitter uh, about it. By the way, also the team in the 80s was widened to include Israeli scholars, and it's truly international and ecumenical now. And I think it includes about 40 people now instead of eight, so you see the difference. So I think uh, that will mean the material will come out much more quickly. Uh, you're still going to have to wait till the year 2000, though, which is eight more years, to get the official volumes of the new scrolls. That's if they go according to the current rate. But because they're available now to everybody, uh, Michael Weiss at the University of Chicago, who prepared the translation I'm going to give you today, and his uh, cooperator, co-author Robert Eisenman, have gone ahead and put in book form, I think it'll be out in about uh, September, in book form, a uh, collection of what they consider to be, I think it's 50 to 75 of the most interesting of the new materials. By interesting, meaning uh, theological ideas, new, new ideas that we didn't know yet so that we can begin to factor those in. So that'll come out immediately. And of course, you'll be able to buy a copy of that. In other words, it'll be in English with translations and commentary. So within a year or two, it's going to begin filtering down. and. Uh, things are spreading. Now I'm going to go to the slides and I'll, I'll make it pretty quick, just go through them so that we have a visual backdrop and then we'll actually go to the text because that's I think what you came for, not just to see a slideshow on the scrolls. Okay, uh, those who know where lights are, yeah, this panel, if you'll hit that big light, the, yeah, the major one. Okay, is that what we got for darkness? Let's go. Who's going to do the projector? Somebody flip the lamp on. Brian will do it, probably. There's somebody back there. 
Now it's so dark I can't see my control. Let's see. Find my button. Okay, forward. Uh, I think what I'll, I think my mic is mobile, so I will stand here where you all won't be. I, I can't see quite as well, but I think I know them pretty well. <clears throat> if any of you want to get up and stand over here for this, it, uh, I'm going to try to keep it to like 10 minutes, so you could go back to your seat. Okay, it's important to start, I think, with a map of Israel. How do you find uh, Qumran? Well, maybe the way to find Qumran. Now, Qumran is the settlement uh, close to the caves, possibly associated with the scrolls. So we can call them the Dead Sea Scrolls or the Qumran Scrolls. The best way to find Qumran is find the Dead Sea. You see it there. Go to the northern tip of the Dead Sea. There you go. See, I have my own pointer here. <laughs> and. Uh, the way, to find, the way to find Jerusalem is to move uh, 13 miles to the west, <laughs> right? I've seen the lecture many times. Right. Okay, and Qumran, if you'll show, is right on the northwest corner there of the Dead Sea. So if you just go from Jerusalem to the Dead Sea, uh, 13 miles, you'll come to the shores of the Dead Sea, and on the northwest corner is where the uh, scrolls were found. Uh, here's a more kind of detailed map, so I bet you can't reach that one, Rolf. Uh, but uh, there's Jerusalem. Now, the reason I threw this in, I, I've written this down to be sure I get it accurate. Jerusalem is 24,000 feet above sea level. The Dead Sea is 13, did I say 1,000? 2,400 feet above sea level. <laughs> 1,000, right? Uh, the holy city. <laughs> 2,400 feet above sea level, the Dead Sea is 1,300 below, so when you go those 13 miles, you're dropping 3,700 feet. If you've made this drive, which many of you have, you know that your ears can pop uh, on either direction, and you are going to the lowest spot on earth. Now, there's a very important text in Isaiah 40, verse 3. Those of you who are Jewish know that that was the reading in the synagogue this past Sabbath, uh, ironically. It starts out, uh, prepare, actually it says, comfort you, comfort you, my people. Remember Handel's Messiah, right? And then what does it say? A voice cries in the wilderness, prepare you the way of the Lord. In the desert, prepare a highway for our God. Make every path straight. The rough ways will be made smooth. Every valley will be lifted. Every mountain will be made low, right? You know the text. Now, in Hebrew, the word for desert there, the second word, prepare a highway in the desert, is arava. This is actually in Hebrew, the Dead Sea. They don't call it the Dead Sea. The ancient name, it's in the Bible if you look this up, is the Sea of the Arava. The Arava is that wilderness valley of the Dead Sea. Okay? So these people are taking this text very seriously. When it says, go into the wilderness and prepare the way, they're taking these terms in the most technical way. What is the way? Remember the early Christians in the book of Acts? I think nine different times they're called the people of the way. And in many Bibles, it'll put capital W. This group also used that same term. Notice I said this group, because we'll get to identity later, right? Uh, they said, we're preparing the way. Now, where do you prepare the way? In the wilderness. But what wilderness? Any wilderness? The Arava. Is go out by the Dead Sea, what we call the wilderness of Judea, and make straight the paths of the Lord. What does that mean? To these people, it meant follow the Torah, the law of God, with incredible persistence and exactitude and absolute devotion of heart, mind, and soul. Be pure. Get away from the corruption of society. Now, if we go to Jerusalem which was the glory of Judaism during the time of Jesus and during what we call the second temple period, the Herodian period. Here's one of the better drawings of uh, the city of Jerusalem and the temple area and so forth and what it looked like. To these people, this looked bad. Why? Because it was profaned in their eyes. If you read the text, they say that the priests are corrupt. 
and that the people are being oppressed and are under uh, the power of, they say, fornication and greed and lies and smooth things they talk about. In other words, this is a radical religious group out in the desert that believes that the religious establishment needs to be shut down, needs to come under the judgment of God for their corruption. And so they're going out into the wilderness. Now, some of them, as many of you know, lived in towns, lived in cities, and cooperated like the Essene Gate uh, is over to, actually it'd be kind of over where I'm standing here. Uh, they did live in a quarter. It's where Jesus uh, traditionally took the Lord's Supper, the last night, you know, the Passover, uh, the night before the Passover, uh, the night before he died. And that was in what we know as the, quote, Essene Quarter, according to Josephus. So there were some of them living in Jerusalem, but they were the city and town dwellers. But in general, there is what I call, and many of us call, and I think this is the best label, forget Essene and all the other names, the Wilderness Apocalyptic New Covenant Movement. That's a mouthful, but it really tells you a lot. They're going out into the wilderness, they're apocalyptic, they think the end is near, and they are New Covenanters. They believe that they are the true church, as we would say in the Christian world, or the true synagogue, the true elect people of God. They talk about that all the way through the scrolls, not just the new scrolls, all the scrolls. We are the elect. We are the chosen. We are the true ones. We are the ones who are going to be the people of the Messiah. Now, obviously, those of you who know the New Testament, that rings all kinds of bells, right? But uh, I'll let you ring them in your own ears until we get to the other question. Now, you go to the Dead Sea, and here are where some of the caves are located, if you can see that. Cave 1, uh, I don't guess you could point. There's Cave 1, the uh, Qumran itself, Cave 11. Uh, for some reason, Cave 3 wasn't put on there. That's up above. Cave 4. But also, scroll materials have been found in Wadi Marabaat, uh, in uh, uh, the river uh, uh, Hever. And so other scroll materials have been found in this watch post, for example, we found five miles south in Wadi Kidron, which would be right about here. Uh, no scrolls so far. So that gives you an idea of where we are. Masada is important because some of you have been there. See down south? So you got your orientation there. Uh, they're on this side of the Dead Sea, uh, on the west side. Scale. And, uh, beg your pardon? Scale and miles between these things? Um, Boy, I think the Dead Sea, if you go down to En uh, I'd say 20, maybe, something like that. Not that far. Yeah, it's easy to look up, but I just... Anybody know exactly? About, uh, 12, 15 miles. To En yeah. yeah. I must have been walking, which I've been in. Yeah. <laughs> if you go to the very tip of the Dead Sea, I think uh, you talk about... Yeah, you're right, it's 26, 30 miles, the whole thing, so that would be about half. Okay, now... Wilderness, for some people, you know, you say wilderness, you think of Oregon, Washington, something like that, right? <laughs> this is on the road from Jerusalem to Jericho. This is the old Roman road. Uh, I, I haven't walked this. Someday I want to walk it with a proper canteen and backup because it could be a little dangerous uh, just in terms of fatigue. You remember what happened to Bishop Pike? Some of you remember back in the 70s who got lost out here. But this is the famous wilderness of Judea. This is where John the Baptist, you open up the Gospels, and it says John the Baptist is out in the wilderness of Judea preaching, right? And he's actually quoting the same verse I just quoted. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare you the way of the Lord. So both groups are, are, are seeing this text as their main text for what they're doing out there. So this is what it looks like. It gets more rugged as you go on. This is almost to Jericho, but just look at that. Uh, you want to try to explore the caves on the way to the Dead Sea? Well, it would take you a lifetime. Uh, the Bedouins have looked and looked and looked, and yet occasionally things will surprise you. There are reports, even in the Middle Ages, of uh, scrolls coming out of jars in caves near Jericho. Uh, so, you know, we get stray reports all through history. But the big find, of course, was in the 40s, as you know. Uh, <coughs> You've turned the bend on the, the new road uh, by Wadi Kelt and you come to Jericho. There's Jericho and there's the plain of the Jordan. And then you turn, you, know, you could pass the Jordan River as you go. I just wanted you to see that if you've never seen the Jordan River because it's more like the creek in your grandfather's backyard in Tennessee somewhere. 
uh, it's not as, uh, it's more the imagination that's made the Jordan great. Uh, this is the river that Moses and the Israelites crossed, and it's uh, where John the Baptist uh, and Jesus uh, congregated, and this is the traditional spot of Jesus' baptism. Now, sometimes people ask, could John and Jesus, you think they knew about the Qumran community? Well, uh, if you stand right here and get away from the trees and look south, you can see it. So, yeah, I suppose they knew about it. I assume they had their normal senses intact. Uh, not as though it was hidden away. Uh, so, they're out in this area, and this is the Jordan River. I, I don't think this is the correct location for the baptism of Jesus, but these pilgrims here are getting baptized. See the bus there? Find the trees? Uh, some of you way back wouldn't be able to maybe see that, but uh, you get some idea of the Jordan River. Then you come to uh, the area where the caves are. Now, this is right behind Qumran, the settlement we call Qumran, where the scrolls were found. And this just gives you an idea of the ruggedness of it and what it looks like. And there are approximately 400 caves in the general area, you know, within a few kilometer radius. And only 11 have yielded scroll material so far. But it uh, doesn't hurt even to keep looking in this area. Uh, from the air, the settlement we call Qumran looks like this after the excavation. Here's an artist's conception of the water system. It's pretty elaborate. And one of the women here was asking me before we started, uh, is it agreed that the, that the people who wrote the scrolls lived in the settlement? No, it's not. Nothing's agreed upon <laughs> in terms of the scrolls. Uh, there are people now looking again at the archaeological evidence. There's some people that have suggested it was a fortress of the Romans. Some have suggested it was a villa of a wealthy, uh, you know, aristocratic Jewish family. Others are still quite persuaded that it is the, uh, what could we call, I hate to say monastic because that may, makes it sound like Christian, you know, monks, but a, a secluded community of the people who wrote the scrolls, you know, that they actually lived here. That is my opinion, that, that this is where they live. One of the reasons I'm convinced of it, and I don't have time to argue it now, is Cave 4, I'll show you. Well, well, let's look at what it looked like, and I'll show you how close K4 is. I can't imagine that a Roman villa was sitting here around the year 68 or so, which is the coin evidence of the settlement, and then the scrolls are hidden just a few yards away, but nobody really knew or whatever. You can come up with other hypotheses to answer that, but to me, the proximity of the settlement and the caves and the water supply together tends to argue that they were living here, living in the caves, and this was kind of their center. Also, Pliny, a, a Roman historian, says that there was a settlement of Essenes uh, north of En Gedi on the shores of the Dead Sea. So, you know, that has helped a lot of us to feel that this has to be it. I mean, he actually gives a location. But here's an artist's conception of what it might have looked like. Just a little village. Uh, the baptistry is particularly interesting, the mikvah. This is not for drinking, but for ritual cleansing. Uh, this, again, makes me wonder if it's a villa. If that's a villa, what is this, a swimming pool? Look at it, steps going down. You know, it's not a water cistern. It's out in the open. We stood in it, Dr. Arnold and I and, Bunch and, Phil and uh, Everett, we were there. We stood at that cistern, walked down, and it's beautifully made. Uh, that one down on the corner there. And uh, we, it fits so well, the scrolls, because they had lots of ritual baths and cleansings and what we call baptisms, you see, uh, dippings. And so uh, we find lots of mikvahs in this place. Uh, here's what it looks like on the ground. Many of you have been there, so I'll go pretty fast on these. Here's one of the mikvahs or baptistries. I, I like to say baptistry just for people who don't know the Jewish terminology, but a place for dipping for ritual cleansing. See the steps, can you make out the steps? You go down into the water, you dip yourself. And uh, any kind of defilement, if you read the Torah, the three kinds of defilement have to do with sex, blood, and death. It's, it, it is not that sex, blood, and death are bad, because in Hebrew thought, I'm not gonna give a lecture here on this, but it's important to explain sometimes to people. Uh, in Hebrew thought, life is certainly affirmed very strongly, lachayim, right, to life. But the idea is that if you go in the presence of God, the eternal, you need to wash off symbolically the signs of mortality, which is human reproduction, death, 
and, and sexuality, you know, that sort of blood and death. And so that was why they did this, you know, the idea of being symbolically clean as you go into a holy area. Well, these people were not in the temple, but they wanted to be clean all the time before God. You see, they want to be ritually clean constantly. If you remember in the Gospel of John, it says a dispute arose between the disciples of Jesus and the disciples of John over what? Anybody remember? Purifications, the King James, I think, says. Dippings, it should be translated. Washings, mikvot. See? In other words, uh, uh, or what's the plural of mikvah? Is it mikvot? Okay, I wasn't sure of that feminine plural there. Okay, uh, a mikvot, that uh, disputes. So there's some evidence there that these Baptist groups out in the wilderness, the Jesus group, the John group, this group, they have disputes about purifications. They're very interested in this subject. Now, we have scrolls now that tell us. Now, here's cave four. Now, I'm standing in the settlement taking this picture. That's where most of the scrolls were found, cave four. Those are the ones that we just got last year in photograph form. See the opening there? Now, originally, that side opening would be closed. Otherwise, I mean, we would have no excuse not to have found those things, right? When DeVoe, the excavator, first went looking, they did not even find this cave on the first expeditions. That's how hidden it was. See the opening at the top? I'll show you an inside view. There's another shot of cave four. You can see the wadi. Look how treacherous that is behind there. I've climbed up all the way to the top. It's incredible up there. And as you go, you just pass caves and pass everything. It's a very interesting area. There's inside cave four. You'll seldom see this because nobody's allowed in. But we had a special permit to do radar ground scan, uh, which can tell you if anything's hidden under the floors. We went all and up, up and down what we call the marls. Uh, these are called marls. Uh, for example, uh, this is cave four. This is one right beside it. I think I've got a, is that out of focus? I don't want to mess with this too much, but it could be. The picture's out of focus, probably. This is called a marl. The question is, maybe this is hollow. If that's hollow, how do you know this isn't hollow? You know, it's possible. The only way to know is with the radar ground scan. So many people have asked me, what, I, I did this with the team in December, Dr. Eisenman organized it. Uh, why haven't they done this before? Uh, I don't know, <laughs> but we did it. And uh, uh, you're going to ask me, well, what did you find? Well, I can tell you that we found evidence that two of the marls, there's about 10 of them on the lake, are hollow. And we're not telling which two because uh, we don't want treasure hunters going out at night tearing up the country. But through proper permits and so forth, if we can make up uh, certain kinds of disputes, lawsuits, and other things that you've been reading about, we can ever get everybody to calm down a little bit and care about the scientific aspect of this, we will go and dig into those and who knows. So I don't think we're through finding things here. That's my hope, my guess, I can't prove it. But anyway, I was making my point about K4. You, uh, you couldn't see it. Now inside, this is what it looks like. This is where our major uh, trove was found. Here's looking out the door. Uh, pretty treacherous to get up there. This is what the jars look like that the scrolls were found in. This is typically what a leather scroll looks like before you unroll it. People just could not believe. Uh, remember the famous uh, Eleazar Sukenik, the Israeli father of uh, Yadin, the famous Yadin. He unrolled the first scrolls and identified them, and he called them the skins. He said, I, he writes in his diary in Hebrew, he said, I looked. I, I read tonight some more in the skins. And by the way, he wrote that, as I recall, on November 29th, uh, 1947, which was the same night that the UN voted the partition of uh, uh, Palestine for a Jewish and Arab state, which the Arabs turned down and which led to the 48 war. So uh, it's I ironic that you've got the scrolls being discovered at the same time. Anyway, this is what they look like. Uh, some were terribly deteriorated. Some are uh, in good shape. Uh, Joe. Technology has just been miniaturized and why it hasn't been done before. That's right. More and more is going to be done. And, and all the new things are being done. Like, the, the, you just look at this picture of the copper scroll before you leave, if you can make it up to the table. 
uh, and I, uh, that uh, uh, Zuckerman took. It, it's unbelievable what, what he's able to produce photographically. Here's what some of them look like. I think it's important that if you've never seen them or some of you've seen pictures in books, uh, this is the famous Manual of Discipline. We don't know what to call it, but the rule, literally, they call it the rule, uh, the order, uh, uh, Sirex. So uh, it, it, it sets up the rules of the community. Uh, Damascus document that actually was found in 1912 in Cairo in a Geniza. You know what a Geniza is, a storehouse for old uh, manuscripts. So w we didn't know what it was, but this shows that this material had circulated. The movement had gotten down to Egypt as well. But then copies were also found at Cairo. This is, uh, which one? This is the Isaiah scroll, and you have part of that in your handout. We're going to look at it today. This is a very interesting little fragment. Uh, Enoch. Joe, you were asking me about Enoch. There it is. That's all we've got. A few more scraps. Now, to, an, uh, to a person like me, this is very beautiful and exciting because Enoch is quoted in the New Testament. Remember in the book of Jude? And Enoch is alluded to over 50 times in the New Testament. Quotations, allusions. Uh, there's a list of them in the back of Charles, if you know. Not Charles Worth, he's later. But the original pseudepigrapha, R.H. Charles, look in the back. He's got a list of all the allusions to Enoch. It's amazing how many there are. Most of them are in the book of Revelation. So it's an apocalyptic work. We'd love to have it. Here's a chapter, column one, uh, verse one which uh, is actually the actual column that's quoted in the New Testament. If you want to look it up, it's in the book of Jude. It says, the Lord will come with 10,000s of his saints in flaming fire and so forth. It's a prophecy of the you know, end of the world and so forth. Now, we have a copy of Enoch in Ethiopic because the Ethiopic church does not have the canon which we in the West have. They have a different canon. You know what canon means? Book uh, lists of uh, Bible, sacred books. They include Enoch in their holy books, so they preserved it. But originally it was written in Hebrew or Aramaic. This is Hebrew. And uh, there are rumors going around, and Professor Strugnell of Harvard says that he has seen a complete copy of Enoch in Hebrew in Jordan. Uh, but it's not in the hands of anybody that we know, and I'm not even sure. I saw that in an interview with him, but I haven't been able to run it down, and I'm probably not the one to do it. But there's a lot of interest in some things that might be still in Kuwait or in Jordan, because uh, remember, uh, we're talking from 1948 to 1967. We've got a 20 year period there when the uh, Jordanians uh, had the material, and, and the Bedouins are certainly willing to sell to our Jordanian at a high price as much as a Israeli, right? So this material. Some of it's maybe got out, but uh, eventually we hope it'll come back. Uh, this is my favorite, the Habakkuk Pesher. Now, what is a Pesher? A Pesher is a commentary on Scripture. It'll quote the Scripture word for word from the Bible, the Hebrew Bible, usually the prophets. Like this is the book of Habakkuk or Habakkuk, right? So it'll say verse 2, uh, chapter 2, verse 2, quote it. Then it'll say, interpreted, that's the word Pesher, this means, and it'll give the meaning. But what do I mean it'll give the meaning? It'll give the meaning of what they believe the text meant in terms of the last days. In other words, it interprets the prophecy for their time, just as apocalyptic groups today. As you well know, living surely in Houston, Texas, there are such groups that would open up uh, Daniel and Isaiah and Jeremiah and say, look, you know, this is talking about this happening right now. That's what this is. So these are wonderful texts to tell us what they believed about what was going on, and it helps us to try to date the text, which I'll get to. This is uh, the War Scroll, I think. I'm not sure. I think that's the War Scroll. This is a coin minted during the revolt. I want to say something about the revolt. Year of our redemption, two, because they begin to date the revolt. This is Masada, where scrolls were found also not many but a few and they're the, some of the same scrolls that were found at Qumran so that's leading us to think that the movement is spread all up and down the Dead Sea that's why this watch post could be important and that that they during the Jewish revolt from 66 to 73 that they were out in the wilderness hiding some fighting some resisting maybe putting things away 
and some amazing things have been found. Uh, you know the story of Masada. I wish I could get into it. There's a pretty spectacular view of the cliffs. I'd like to try to climb up that side. I wouldn't, try, I wouldn't advise it. Sister at Masada. So uh, synagogue at Masada. The hair of one of the Jewish women who uh, committed suicide the night before the Romans uh, broke in. And uh, they did find some of the bodies. 960 died, and I think they found, uh, uh, as I recall, 18 maybe bodies, 15 to 18 bodies, including the body of an unborn child. Uh, now, I threw this in just to make a point about the Copper Scroll. The Copper Scroll is a, a Dead Sea Scroll uh, found in uh, Cave 3, pretty near Qumran. It lists hiding places of uh, treasure, maybe temple treasures, in many locations, and some of them are in Jerusalem even. This is the Valley of Hinnom. Here's the Valley of Kidron. Some of these are mentioned. You can walk from this Valley of Kidron to the Dead Sea. I wouldn't recommend it, but it can be done. And the fortress or watch post that we found in December is on Wadi Kidron. And a lot of the escapees tried to get out this wadi. If you remember the famous story of the Babylonian captivity, this is in 2 Kings. Uh, what is it? King Jehoiakim, I think, or Jehoiakim, the one, or it might have been uh, Zedekiah. I'm trying to remember. I think it was Zedekiah. He flees out Wadi Kidron and tries to make it for the Dead Sea and gets caught. You know, so it's sort of an escape route to get out to the desert. But anyway, that's what it looks like. There's tombs down there. There's the famous tombs. Many of you have seen. Now, what's this? Amazing. In Wadi Murabaat, which is still north of En Gedi, in, uh, was found the Bar Kokhba hideout. And here are slides. Uh, that's a letter written by Bar Kokhba. These are uh, different tools and instruments. Those are actually locks and jug, uh, keys rather, a uh, trowel. Uh, the basket, that's original. That's 2,000 years old. Uh, well preserved in the desert, including the letter from Bar Kokhba, which encouraged all of us to believe. See, Bar Kokhba was the, uh, many believed he was the Messiah who led a second revolt uh, in the 130s AD or CE, and to find his headquarters cave with dispatch letters when he was running his war is an incredible discovery. Actually, a couple of them signed by him. Uh, although that's been somewhat disputed, but uh, whether it's his signature or a, a copyist, but uh, I, uh, you know, I'll go with the signature because it seems like it is his cave. So uh, that's it. Pretty. I, I bet I took more than ten minutes, didn't I? <laughs> now I've got to have some light, and I bet you do too. Let's begin. Uh, if you can find in the stapled handout the three texts, we're going to begin with the one that's called the Messianic Apocalypse. I hope that's staple first. This was found, this uh, is one of the new, let's call them the newly published scrolls because in a way everything's been published. I mean, it is available, but not all translated and so on. This is one that was found by Michael Weiss uh, just looking through the photographs back in November. He called me when he found it. He was quite excited about it. And then I noticed something that he didn't notice about it that got us both even more excited. And then I published uh, a scholarly article about it, and a popular article will come out in Bar later this year, uh, because what we discovered was the first uh, absolute literary parallel to the to a New Testament text. That's what interested people. Now there are lots of verbal parallels, like both groups talk about the New Covenant. But I'm talking about a literary parallel, meaning a phrase or a whole concept of a technical term is parallel. Now, we'll test your knowledge of the New Testament, see if some of you. To me, it was no great discovery. As soon as I read it, uh, since I spend my life teaching these texts every day to college students for the last 15 years, I just said, 
Oh, I, I probably can't quote what I said. I just said, wow. <laughs> That's word for word out of the Gospel of Luke. <laughs> uh, and uh, anyway, let's start with line one. Now, you've got the Hebrew. If you read Hebrew, it's not very clear. But if you read Hebrew, at least look at the first line because you can very clearly see uh, the... Actually, look at the transcription. You can really see it there. And then you got, you've got Hashemayim v'ha'aretz, the heavens and the earth will obey. See the verb Shema. And then we have the verb Mashiach with the L on it, the La Mashicho. The heavens and the earth will obey his Messiah. Now that's what caught the attention of Dr. Weiss. He's at the University of Chicago. Because any text that mentions the Messiah, naturally, you know, we get pretty interested in because Christ Christianity is a messianic group, really, right? I mean, and frankly, Christianity is a messianic Jewish group, if you want to get really historical, right? It's a messianic movement within Judaism. So anything about a Messiah is important. But notice, if you, even if you don't know Hebrew, Mashiach here is singular. His Messiah, not Messiahs, plural. Now, one of the things that has been said, and you'll see this in any book that you read, uh, they will say, and I'm going to pull the article here that, and, and just read you something. Uh, you will read quite often that uh, the Qumran group believes in two Messiahs. They believe in a Messiah of Levi, or Aaron, a priest Messiah, and a Messiah of David. Now, you all want to hear all this in detail, right? Because I feel like I'm starting to get technical, but yeah, you do. <laughs> you can't. I can tell you're real students of these things, so I want to be scholarly with you. Now, a lot of people don't realize, and many times, uh, I bet you could quiz some scholars that aren't experts on this, how many texts in all the Dead Sea Scrolls mention two messiahs? Because you look it up anywhere, it'll say that the Qumran people believe in two messiahs. How many texts mention two messiahs? One text. Only one text ever says two messiahs. It's a, a version of 1QS, we call it. And what it says is, uh, I'll read it. They will be judged uh, by the statutes by which the community members were ruled at first until there will come the prophet and the messiahs, plural, of Aaron and Israel. See, the Messiah of Israel and the Messiah of Aaron. So Messiah is plural. But that's the only time the word is in the plural. And so actually that evidence has been a little bit overdone in publishing this in a new article because we have another version now of 1QS, that same text, in the new material. And actually I think it was a fragment of it was published earlier. So it's been, just hadn't been pointed out yet. It lacks these lines. See, so that makes you wonder whether it could have been added later or do we have what we call redaction or history. So right now, we're at the point where we shouldn't go around saying, oh, they believed in two messiahs because we're not even sure of the one text that mentions two. And now here's a new text that mentions one. And we're going to look at another one that mentions one. And so uh, we, we've got to go back and relook at all the material and be very careful with it and see what we're talking about. Because it could be that this group uh, is looking uh, for uh, one main Davidic Messiah. Now, I will point out, though, that Messiah in English is a little deceptive. Actually, it means anointed one, right? And pr every priest is a Messiah in that sense, anointed. Every high priest is anointed. Every king is anointed. And so you have to keep that in mind and don't go too much off of the word Messiah. Oh, that means the Messiah, capital M. It can just mean anointed one. Uh, Abraham, for example, is called an anointed one in uh, one of the Psalms. Touch not my anointed ones, uh, the patriarchs. It just means my chosen ones, my selected ones. But as you can see from line one on this text, clearly this is not just some general reference to any anointed one. Fairly powerful figure, wouldn't you say? The heaven and the earth will obey his Messiah. We assume his means who? God, Hashem, the Lord. The heavens and the earth will obey his Messiah. The sea and all that is in them, and then you can go on and down and read. Now, I'm not going to do the whole text uh, in detail because you've got it to read, but I want to point out a couple of things. Look at line six in English. His spirit will hover over the poor. 
Now, when, when you read that word poor, it's very interesting because this group call themselves the poor ones. The poor ones. Uh, it can be the word as it is here, uh, anavim, but it can also be evana, evanim or the Ebionite idea. And it would be the same word Jesus used when he talks about blessed are the poor who will inherit the earth, the meek, the poor. You see the avanim. And so they're using it as technical terms. In other words, they are the poor. They don't just mean you don't have money. God's poor ones, meaning we are meek before God, we are the true ones, we are waiting. So they talk about that, the spirit will hover over the poor. Notice uh, line eight, he will release the captives, make the blind see, and raise up the downtrodden. That's an exact quote from Psalm 146. I might also mention that in the Jewish prayer book, I brought a small copy here, that three of those phrases, and those of you who know Hebrew, let me just read this. What does matir asarim remind you of? Because you say it uh, every day in the daily prayer. You know, it's in the, what's called the Amidah, uh, the matir asarim, release the captives. Uh, and uh, also, I believe, make the blind see. The next phrase is also in the prayer book. That makes me wonder if this is not a liturgical text. See, we don't know the genre. Genre means, what is this? Was it in a book? Or, but because some of the exact phrases are in the daily, the most important prayer in Judaism is called the Amidah. And these phrases are in that prayer. And they're also quoted in the New Testament, which I'll get to. It makes me wonder whether maybe the group stood up in their service and I could see them like a hymn you know, saying, and now let us recite the hymn of the Messiah. And you could see them all saying, and the heavens and the earth will obey his Messiah, and the spirit will hover the poor, and maybe they chanted it, you know? You see the idea? Those of you who understand how liturgy works, you can see this. It would inspire you, you see, as to what's coming. It would make you want the Messiah to come. Now, the big discovery, I think, is line 12. It says... Then he will, and we assume this is still the Messiah, and I'll, I'll explain why it could be argued. By the way, Charles Worth is publishing uh, the major article on this that Michael Weiss and I wrote. It's a very technical scholarly article, but there'll be a popular version in Bar in, in the next issue of uh, the Journal of the Pseudepigrapha. So if you're into the scholar, some of you scholars can jot that down. You know what that is, but you can get the scholarly article. Anyway, uh, uh, I said verse 12, <laughs> line 12. We assume this is the Messiah, and we argue that in the article. He will heal the wounded, resurrect the dead, and to the poor announce the glad tidings. Now, if you know Hebrew, you can look at the Hebrew. It's pretty interesting. Uh, heal the wounded is also in the prayer book, the daily prayer book, Amidah. Exactly the same in Hebrew, so that's interesting too. But it says, he will raise the dead and to the poor announce glad tidings. Again, the technical phrase, the poor. Now, let me read you Isaiah 61, which talks about an anointed one. Okay, Isaiah 61. And I'm going to connect it a little bit to uh, Christianity here. here it's, it's someone talking to about God. Maybe the prophet, maybe someone who wants to fulfill this role. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord, and that is the eternal uh, uh, Yahweh, has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted, the poor. Now, that's the same word there, anavim. To bring good news to the poor, to proclaim liberty to the captives, freedom to the prisoners, and proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. So here we have a text in Isaiah 61 which also mentions an anointed one, Mashiach, bringing good news to the poor ones. Good news is, is the Hebrew word uh, from which we get the word, of course, gospel, right? Good news. So it's the same word. Now, what's interesting about this text? You, some of you will be ahead of me. In the Gospel of Luke, this is interesting for Christians. In the Gospel of Luke, Jesus gets up in the synagogue, and this is what we call the Haftarah reading. Okay, it's the reading from the prophets. It's in Luke chapter 4. And he reads this text just like I read it. Not the Qumran text, Isaiah 61. And he says, this day, the, this is fulfilled, the scripture. In other words, he's saying, I am that one. I am that Mashiach 
that is going to come and do all these things. Now, to a group like this, that would have been quite electrifying. Either they would have believed it or not believed it or what, but you get the idea of the claim, the claim you're making, just like you could take this text and say, let me read you this text, and then I say, I am this one. It's a very incredible claim, right? The heavens and the earth will obey me uh, to claim to be the Messiah. Uh, uh, so this is a high, we call it high Christology, right? This text has a high Christology. It doesn't say that the Messiah is God, but the Messiah has the functions of God. He rules heaven and earth and the sea and all that's in them. And he raises the dead. Who else can raise the dead but God, you see? So he's a very powerful messianic figure here. Now, two things about this. We had no clear text before this one that said that the Qumran community believed in resurrection of the dead. Now, I never had a doubt in because they're an apocalyptic Jewish group deep into the prophets, and I think it's understood that they would not be like the Sadducees and deny the resurrection. You know, I, I, but I couldn't prove it. There were a few obscure texts. People argued it back and forth. This is the clear text. They definitely believe in resurrect, you know, resurrection of the dead, and they use a phrase that the Jews later have in the prayer book, which is the technical phrase for the belief in the resurrection of the dead. And you can see it here in the Hebrew. This is a slight variation of it, but metim yekhiye. In other words, he will make live the metim, the dead. He will make live the dead, and uh, to the poor preach the good news. Now, here's the kind of clincher. This text is quoted again in Luke later. Where? Luke 7. Now, you might not have a Bible with you, so I'll read it. This isn't church, right? So, you already went there. Uh, so, Luke 7. Now, when I saw this, see, you know, I don't know if you're as excited as I am, but I was, I was like, couldn't talk for a while and walked around my office, <laughs> started calling people. <laughs> In fact, we called your friend Charles Worth and told him about it. Uh, you know, have you looked at this yet? Now, here it is. In Luke 7, verse 18, John the Baptist goes and he's in prison uh, on the other side of the Jordan in the, in the uh, fortress at, uh, not Hyrcania, what is it? Um, no, it's not the Herodium. Yeah, Machaerus. He's in, I don't I get these fortresses, at Machaerus. And he sends word to Jesus. He sends a deputation to Jesus, his uh, co-worker, and he says, are you the one, or should we look for another? Right? Now, that's a kind of in question between these groups. You, you get the idea. They're very coded language. Are you the one? What one? Right? Obviously, the one we're all waiting for, right? And he says, go report to John what you have seen and heard. Now, let me read you this. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have the gospel preached to him, them. See that? Did you catch it? Okay, now why is that so important? I mean, you could say, well, they shuffle language or whatever. Here's why it's, not import it's so important. Isaiah 61 does not, when it quotes this, does not say the dead will be raised, does it? Right? Talks about the Messiah coming, does not mention raising the dead. This text mentions the dead will be raised and the poor will have the good news preached. We go to Luke and it mentions the same signs of the Messiah. What that tells us is that Luke and the gospel writers know of a technical list of criteria for identifying the Messiah. Now it's, he's going to do this, 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 and it's technical. It, it's these definite Hebrew phrases. See? And Luke knows that list, and now we have a text from Qumran where they know the same list, even word for word. That's why it's significant. Now, there's one other thing about it. This is not just any text in Luke. First, it's a text between John the Baptist and Jesus. Now, scholars have said for years, and there's general agreement, that probably John the Baptist either was a member of this community or had a lot to do with it. The dispute has always been, was Jesus? But almost everybody has always agreed he's out in the wilderness, he's quoting the same verse, you know, I'm out in the wilderness preparing the way of the Lord, and here's these people right down the road, a couple miles. So he had something to do with the group, uses some of the same language. 
But uh, so that's significant. This isn't just any text. It's a text of a Baptist wilderness preacher talking to another messianic figure, Jesus, and saying, are you that one? And he sends back the list and says, go tell him one, two, three, four, five, six. See the idea? And then we have this text where these people would have said, oh, one, two, three, four, five, six. I see. So we've got a, it, it's a tightening of, of, of the link, a very fascinating kind of tightening of the link between uh, the two communities and what might have been going on. Okay, I've got to hurry. I'm tempted to say more about it, but we've got to go on. I, I, let me, I said there were two things. One, I've got to add this one thing. This is real scholarly, but for some of you, you'll, know, you'll, you'll find this interesting. This is also a section of Luke that is not just any section, but Luke 7 is what we call the Q source of Luke. Now, Q means quella in German source. It is a list. We think it was the earliest collection of the sayings and teachings of Jesus. In other words, it's earlier than any of the Gospels. And Luke had it and Matthew had it, according to the dominant theory. And so the fact that this quote is from that section even makes it more intriguing because that means it's the earliest gospel material written down probably within a decade or two of uh, the death of Jesus himself. You see, so it, it, it takes away the idea that, well, maybe this is a later edited version or something that was written at the turn of the century. As we seem to be getting back to the days of the 50s AD, 40s, when these groups were very excited and expecting that this was the end. You know, they were on the edge of their seats. All the signs were there. And if you read your Josephus, you know, our historian of the period, he tells about many messianic types at this time showing up and claiming to have this or that power from God. And so uh, it's very interesting. Now look at your next text. Now this is the one everybody is uh, raving about. <laughs> This is either nothing or it's the most interesting one that's ever turned up. <laughs> now, Michael Weiss said recently, it's almost a rule of Qumran studies that right at the part where you absolutely need a word or you need another phrase or, you know, to interpret a scroll, it'll be broken or faded. <laughs> that that's a rule of Qumran studies. Now, you have a fascinating statement like they put to death the Messiah, and then the next set will be broken off where you can't be sure if that's what it says. <laughs> that's just the Murphy's Law of Qumran Scrolls, <laughs> is, is it tantalizes you. It says, oh, maybe it means this, but no, maybe it means this. Now, this broke big news, as you know. You know, Qumran hits the front page of the New York Times kind of thing. It, it was in every paper in the country, November 9th last year. Uh, scholars uncover scroll mentioning slain Messiah, right? Crucified, not crucified, but slain Messiah with woundings and piercings. And the translation on the right was issued. Let's look at it. Isaiah the prophet. Now this is a very conservative translation. If you notice the one on the left has a lot more words. There are two ways of translating Qumran scrolls. One is to guess a lot, and the other is to only put down exactly what is clear. And if it's not clear, just put a blank, even though it's nonsense. And other scholars try to uh, extrapolate a little bit. You know, well, maybe it might have said this. So you look at these two and you say, on the left, you have Isaiah the prophet, the thickets of the forest will be cut down. Well, it doesn't say anywhere the thickets of the forest. It doesn't even say will be cut unless that thing right up in the corner here, see that? Unless that might mean will be cut, but we're not sure, even with your infrared enhancement. By the way, on the infrared computer, I said infrared, computer enhanced fragment. If you know anything about computer enhancing, which I bet some of you do, it's a very subjective art, particularly for handwriting, because you have to tell it to thicken and thin and, and increase the pixels and so on under, in a certain way. And sometimes you end up creating things that aren't there. So don't go too wild over, oh, we got the computer enhanced fragment and it says this. I'll give you an example. Look at the very bottom of the unenhanced photo. That's what you'd see if you just looked at the scroll. The very bottom, you'll see some marks in Hebrew and the second letter from right to left has an opening. It looks almost like a little, uh, what we call a chet, 
right? Uh, what would it be like a box almost? Now look over at the computer enhance. The opening has been lost. Now is that an improvement or a uh, lack of improvement? See, see my point? Now there's a computer enhan enhancement closed the hole there and therefore didn't help. So you got to be careful. You say, well, it's very clear here. You still got to look at the photo. Okay. So anyway, uh, we're, let's look at the first translation on the right. This was the first one released, Eisenman and Weiss. Isaiah the prophet, the scepter will go forth from the root of Jesse. This is an exact quotation from Isaiah 11, verse 1. It is the most messianic text in the whole Hebrew Bible. No doubt about it. It's a Davidic king is going to come from the line of Jesse. And he's going to rule and reign and so forth. You know, and it describes him in very high terms, just like that other text we looked at. Then it says something about the branch of David. And then it says something about they will judge or they will be judged. And then it says, here's the controversial, this is line four. And they put to death, or maybe uh, he will be put to death. They put to death the leader of the community, the branch of David. And then it says, next line, with wounds, maybe piercings the high priest will order. Now that's a conservative translation. The only thing that is disputed in that translation is line four. Now this really gets down to, you'll probably feel like uh, arguing over teeny little points and to some degree it is. Uh, let me get my notes here because I want to clarify it for you. Uh, when it says they put to death the leader of the community, the branch of David, in the right translation. That would mean that somebody, a group, killed a Messiah, a branch of David, with woundings and piercings. Now, obviously, the text electrified the Christian community because they happened to believe in a descendant of David who was put to death with woundings and piercings by a high priest whose tomb might have just been found, as you know, Caiaphas, uh, last month. So. You read your paper yesterday. So, uh, you know, you could imagine how interesting this is. Uh, by the way, that says something about publication. I feel no matter what this text finally means, I'll explain the other translation. Let's say it doesn't even mean that. It still should have been published as soon as anybody saw it, just because of the uh, inherent interest. Here is a text. It's Isaiah the prophet, the Messiah, something about somebody getting judged and put to death with woundings and piercings. I don't care how you translate it, it ought to be out talked about because it's of interest to people. You know, it's not just a calendar text listing how to count the new moon or something. It's a pretty interesting text. And yet, uh, uh, I won't say the person's name, but a certain individual had it for 40 years and just said, well, you'll get it when you get it. And in fact, he's the one quoted who said, you'll get it when you get it. <laughs> uh, and uh, we wouldn't still have it unless uh, the photographs had come out. Now here's the problem. Last year, you might have, not last year, last month, another AP Wire story. We get all our news now from the AP Wires, right? And that's because the AP is hooked in now with about eight or 10 of us and they call us all the time wanting to sensationalize the latest uh, thing. I hope nobody from AP is here, but if they are, no, actually I don't care because we're not sensationalizing. We're trying to explain to the public what you know this is really all about. But another story came out, the first story was in November of last year, slain Messiah text. And if you saw the story last year, it said, slain Messiah, maybe slaying Messiah. <laughs> in other words, maybe it's not that the Messiah was slain, but maybe that the Messiah is going to slay. <coughs> in other words, the more standard view, which is that a ruling, powerful Messiah would come and uh, slay the wicked. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, <clears throat> you're going to laugh at this, but it all turns on the translation of one word. <clears throat> That's the verb to put to death. And if you know anything about Hebrew, if we put the vowels in, see the vowels are not written in this text. That's the problem. Uh, they go by context, and presumably the readers of this text knew which way to put it. But if you put the vowels in one way, you have uh, Hami 2, okay? Hami 2, which is, for those of you who know Hebrew, a hifil perfect, which means they put to death. 
and then you just go on reading. They put to death the branch of David, uh, the prince of the congregation, the Messiah. You know, very clear. That's what first came out. Perfectly legitimate reading. But you can change two points, two little vowel points, actually one and another changes out of uh, rhythm, and you can end up with hamito. Listen, hamito, hamito, and guess what that means? Hamito, we'll shift it to the other side of the page there. The branch of David, uh, the prince of the congregation, will put to death him, unspecified, somebody else. Like maybe the wicked evil ruler or something, you know, antichrist kind of idea. You know, the Messiah will come and put to death him. So that's the big controversy. Now you've got it. Uh, how do you decide then? Well, you make arguments on other bases. So what you got to do, if you get the latest issue of Bar Magazine, unless the new ones come out yet, but the one, uh, what does it have on the cover? Anybody remember? You know, it's... Circles. Yeah, the circles. Get that one. It has the, argu the new argument that this is not a slain Messiah. Forget that. It's just a text saying the Messiah will come and slay his enemies. No big deal. And the woundings and piercings will be their woundings and piercings, not his. So it's nothing to do with anybody getting slain or killed as a Messiah. In the next issue of Bar, there's an article coming out that I wrote, just offering the other side, because I want to keep it going. Because in the current issue, the article's written in such a way, I think it says, interpretation dissolves, or something like that. And that angered me. I said, no, wait a minute. Uh, there is a little more to say here. For example, in line three, just want to give you a taste of what scholars spend their time doing. The verb is plural. Nobody disagrees with that. It's from shafat. They will judge. Now, if it's plural in line three, they will judge. Why isn't it plural in line four? And they will put to death. See? So you can make that argument. It's, it's all, we're not going to solve it. That's the tantalizing thing. This is uh, basically blown up a little bit. It's smaller than this actual size. We need some more lines. We don't have them. But there are some other arguments, and I'm, I make them in this article. You can maybe get that and read them. And we're not going to nail this down, but I wanted you to know the issues. And it really is uh, just the problem is we just have a fragment. We're going to have to wait a minute. But it does intrigue us because it raises the question, might the Qumran community have had great hope in some figure. Now, I ha this has nothing to do with this being Jesus or anything like that. That's not, nobody could go with that kind of identification. I would, look at the text, you wouldn't know anything like that. But could they have thought somebody was a branch of David, you know, and that person be put to death, and that they're lamenting this. They're saying that these wicked priests put to death the prince of our congregation, uh, the, the branch of David you know, lamenting that. Now, I argued in my article that that could very well be the case. For example, if you look at people we know in the New Testament who get wiped out, we don't have a very good record. Uh, what happens to John the Baptist? What happens to these wilderness Baptists? He's beheaded by Herod. What happens to Jesus of Nazareth? He's crucified. What happens to James, the brother of Jesus? He's stoned. Was he a descendant of David? Yes, see? So we got a lot of descendants of David getting killed. Josephus tells us of some more. So it's not beyond question that this group could have been experiencing some event. And, uh, you know, people are going to speculate. And, of course, the wildest speculation was this is talking about Jesus. There's no way to prove anything like that. Uh, but uh, it does show you something on how fascinating, you know, these new texts can be. And maybe there'll be some more things that will help us clarify. I don't know if there'll be more to clarify this text exactly, but others. Uh, so we wanted to show you that. Now, a final one. Guess what? Somebody's going to have to give me a copy of it. No, wait, I might have one. No, I don't need a copy. The Isaiah, I'll just use the Hebrew here. Uh, I, where's Philip Arnold? How, how am I doing on time? Because I blocked out time. Okay, I'll try to, because we want to give you some time for questions. So I'll do this quickly. Okay. Isaiah 53. Now, 
Isaiah 53 is a text that Christians made much use of in the beginning in the early church and much, much use as time went on. And it became very controversial between Jews and Christians. It's not read today in the synagogue in the Haftarah readings, the readings of the prophets. Uh, it raises uh, a lot of arguments between Jews and Christians because it talks about a suffering servant and it's the famous one that is even, I mentioned Handel's Messiah, this one makes it too. He was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement, our stripes were upon him, uh, he was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and so forth, right? Now, there are many interpretations of this, both uh, in, in Judaism, it's not as though Jews have no interpretation, and some Jews have even said it is a suffering Messiah. There is, that's the minor interpretation. Uh, the Messiah ben Yosef, you know, one that comes and suffers. But the major interpretation is it's the people of Israel, the people of God, the true people of God, who are led like a sheep to the slaughter and yet testify of the covenant. And that is indeed how the phrase is used throughout the book. My servant Jacob, the servant of the Lord, and, and so forth. But there are places in the text which seem to talk about an individual. That's what the Christians picked up on. They said, well, yes, it's the people of God, just as Jesus said, take up a cross and follow me. You know, everybody suffers. But it seems to be very particular in places. Like it says, he makes his grave with the wicked and is buried with a rich man, which the Christians, you know, understood to be Jesus and so on. Now, the Dead Sea Scrolls, this is not a newly published text. This is one of the first published texts. But I just wanted to point this out, point out something about looking at the older text too. I, we have a complete copy of Isaiah. You've got a sheet of it here. This is the column of Isaiah 53. And people always ask, does the Isaiah of the Hebrew Bible that we use today for our English translations, does that Isaiah differ from the Isaiah of the scrolls? Compare it word for word, which scholars have done by now, right? Word for word, every line, every letter they've looked at. And they've compared it. Now, does it differ, does it not differ? Generally, it doesn't differ very much. Uh, spelling and word changes and so forth. But there are interesting differences. And I want to show you one of the interesting differences that probably is a result of Jewish Christian arguments. Okay? It's just kind of interesting. If you look at verse 11, and I know you don't know Hebrew, but some of you, but yeah, I got a word circled there. And I'll read it to you in English. Uh, actually, I think I can just remember the quote. It says, uh, from the travail, uh, let me get my light here. Uh, some of you want to try the Hebrew, you can, you can see that. Ma'amah, ma'amah, from the travail, and then you've got the word nefesh, uh, the, of, of his soul. From the travail of his soul, he will see. Now, if you have an old King James, it'll say, he will see the travail of his soul and be satisfied. The problem with that translation is it doesn't say he will see the travail of his soul. It says from the travail of his soul he will see. There's m from cannot be the direct object. You follow? So the King James did the best they could. But the point is something's dropped out of here. As we don't have the object. From the travail of his soul he will see what? What's he going to see? So they didn't know what to do with it because their text, it doesn't have a blank, it just syntactically, grammatically didn't make sense. Now we go to the Dead Sea Scrolls and that word I have circled there, or, or, light. From the travail of his soul he will see light. Okay? Now in the verse before this it says that he's dead in a grave and then he sees light. See? Okay? So what would Christians, how would Christians interpret light if they had a text that said or in it? Would they go wild with it? <laughs> to see light is a metaphor. The dead are in the dark world, sleeping in the dust, and you wake up and see light. What is that? Resurrection of the dead. It's, it's a cryptic reference to resurrection. So they would have been very excited. The point is the modern Hebrew Bibles don't have light. Okay? Why? Because at some point, there was probably a controversy 
uh, and one text kept it and one text didn't. We have you know, various text families and traditions, the Samaritan, the Syriac, and so on. And so it's gone. But what's interesting is the text that has it is a very Jewish text, a Qumran text, right? And so their copy had the word light. Now, what's the big deal about that? It can still be interpreted as Israel uh, because Israel is raised from the dead in Ezekiel 37 and goes back to the land. So that's not, you know, you, it isn't that you can go get your Jewish neighbors if you're Christian and say, look, I got a text. That, <laughs> that's not, I mean, their interpretation is interpretation. It'll go on forever. The point is a simple point. Some Hebrew texts have light, some don't. That's the point. But the ones that the early Christians used must have had light in it. I think it's more likely for this reason. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, I delivered to you the gospel, how that the Messiah died and was buried according to the scriptures and was raised according to the scriptures on the third day according to the scriptures. Now, we've never known what text he was talking about. See, because you could say, well, maybe he's this psalm or this, and people piece it together. But if you put this reading back in, he is following an exact order, Isaiah 53. He's led like a lamb to the slaughter, death. He's buried with a rich man, buried. And, or rather, in a rich man's grave, he is buried. From the travail of his soul, he will see light, resurrection. See? So probably what Paul is doing there is doing what we call a pesher, an interpretation of this text. So you see how this helps us to recover the early Christian background, that they had a text that had light. Now you look in your Bible, and it depends. Don't go out and say, I work for the Revised Standard Version Company or whatever. But the new RSV that, you know, a lot of, I think everybody should buy it as a scholar. It's, it's the latest and maybe the best modern translation. Let me read you what they've done. They have put back all the readings from Qumran that they feel may have been there, but they footnote it, so you have a choice. But in this case, they put it in because grammatically it makes such perfect sense. Otherwise, you've got, he will see nothing, and you know, you can't make sense. So if I can, this print is so small. My brother-in-law just bought me this, and I'm glad to have it to carry around, but I must be, how old am I? I'm, uh, I'm starting to do like old people do like this. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, this is the new RSV. Uh, it's, I think the New Jerusalem Bible has taken this. I think the NIV has also done this now, the New, uh, new International. Some of you can check. Okay, here we go. Okay, it says, He will make his soul an offering for sin. Out of his anguish he will see light. See, it's in there. And then it has a footnote that says, according to the Dead Sea Scrolls, 1Q, and, and, you know, explains it. So some of the newer translations now are putting back these readings. How important is it? Well, in a text like this, it's of great interest to uh, scholars to try to recover the text that these Messianic groups might have been using, obviously. Um, I was also going to talk a little bit about the identity of the two groups, but maybe that'll have to be another lecture. The main thing <clears throat> was to bring you these three. All of them have some overlaps between Jews and Christians. And uh, my conclusion, I could kind of give you a conclusion statement, would be that the people of the scrolls are a messianic apocalyptic wilderness new covenant group. Whoever they were, messianic, right, apocalyptic group out in the wilderness, and certainly the Jesus movement, let's call it, not the Christian church so much, but the Jesus movement, is a wilderness apocalyptic messianic movement. And these texts show us that they have a lot of common vocabulary and notions. Now, are they the same group? Certainly the majority of scholars would say no. Uh, my own opinion is that uh, it's a yes and no. Uh, they're the same if you take a broad view of apocalyptic Messianic Judaism. If you take a narrow view, you know, you, people always want to know the teacher's opinion or the lecturer's opinion, so at the last I'll throw it out. My opinion is that Jesus uh, had a lot to do with this group, knew all about it, used a lot of the language, but uh, would have broken with such a group. You know, maybe grew up with it and was influenced something, but would not have agreed with much of what they taught 
particularly their stand on dealing with Gentiles, women, uh, outcasts, lepers, um, so-called sinners, you know, uh, where, where there's a lot of material in the Gospels that he crossed the lines of ritual purity and like touching the leper and things like this, that there, he was a, uh, I don't want to call him a reform rabbi, but he was a little looser on the, on the interpretation of the Torah. And one concrete example I can't resist throwing out because it's just word for word in the scrolls. In the scrolls it says if your animal falls in a pit or gives birth on the Sabbath, Shabbat, the rest day, you may not assist that animal. You know, the life of an animal is not worth the breaking of the Sabbath. You could help a human life, but not an animal. Jesus specifically takes the position in uh, Luke and in Matthew, which the Pharisees also held, that you could also save the life of an animal on the Sabbath. So see, there's just a little example where one rabbi has one ruling, one rabbi has another ruling. And uh, I don't think these people would have agreed with uh, his approach on many things. But on the other hand, they share many, many ideas, don't they? And they are living in the same general area at the same time, in the same place, and so on. So that makes the scrolls of great interest to Christians. They're also interesting to Jews because here we have a form of Judaism that died out, that didn't survive, except as it survived in Christianity, you know, apocalyptic Messianic Judaism. Uh, and so uh, Jews uh, who are interested in their history get to read about a sect that, uh, you know, we wouldn't have known much about otherwise. Uh, in other words, the Pharisees triumph, we have the Talmud, the Mishnah, but, but here's a whole another branch, you might say, of Judaism that was highly influential and, by the way, quite patriotic. You know, these people bled and died for their country, Masada again, so uh, in that sense, the Israelis have made them heroes, national heroes, uh, you could call them zealots. So. Uh, it's a fantastic interest to both Jews and Christians, I think, uh, to uncover more scrolls and see what these scrolls say. Now, Philip is going to narrate, or rather moderate, uh, questions. Do so. we have some questions for Dr. Tabor? Uh, yes, we have one right here. Uh, you infer that all of the Dead Sea community were the same. Could you stand up and, and say your question very loudly so everyone can hear? Or I'll repeat it if... Yeah. You suggest that all the communities on the Dead Sea were the same, but I don't think that's not, that's not necessarily true, that all of them were. Uh, he asked about, uh, to say all the communities are a scene. Uh, the whole question uh, suggests 20 minutes of problematic answers. Uh, part of it is, what is an Essene, which we dealt with a bit last night at our seminar. Um, we don't even know what the word is seen means. If it means osim ha Torah, doers of the law, then they could be this group. Uh, I mean, that would help to understand what that word might mean. Zealous for the law, doers of the law. I think the thrust of your question is just because you find other groups like at Masada or at Engedi or at this new place to assume they were with this community. No, that can't be assumed. There are all kinds of groups fighting the Romans for their own reasons, including Pharisees. And uh, in some case, you know, what we call the zealots. Uh, what I was saying is their, their scroll materials were also found at Masada. And mikvahs and synagogues are a synagogue. And so we assume that the group at Masada had some sympathies or connections with this movement. But, right, it's not absolutely tight. We have a question here in the back, sir. Yeah. Have you ever read any text in Aramaic in reference to Jesus? I've never read any Dead Sea text that I could prove refers to Jesus in Aramaic, Hebrew, or Greek, which are the three languages. That, like his name or anything like that. Is that what you mean? Are there any texts in Aramaic? In the Dead Sea Scrolls? In the Dead Sea Scrolls or anything you've ever read in your scholarly work? That refers to Jesus by name. About Jesus or to Jesus? About Jesus, maybe these do. Uh, you know, meaning the Christians feel he's the Messiah who'll come and raise the dead and preach good news, and this group did too, and so you could make a loose connection. But specifically, this man, name, address, social security number, no. Do we have another qu question? Eric, I recognize you, Eric. Yes. 
Uh, there's been but that doesn't mean we want to forget them, right? <laughs> you may want to. But, uh, there's, a, there's a long history of uh, contention between the Masoretic texts of the Old Testament and the Septuagint. Now, this kind of relates to what you right. said about the Isaiah. That's uh, right. Allegro, of all people, uh, makes a case in his book uh, for the legitimacy of the Septuagint translation. I was wondering if you could uh, make well, a comment on that. Well, okay, the Masoretic text, he's asking about the different versions of Isaiah that we have. The Masoretic text is a Greek translation of the Hebrew made before the time of Jesus, although there's several versions of it, but the basic text, we, we, I, I'm relating it to Jesus for Christian purposes, you know, before the B.C., B.C.E. Septuagint. Septuagint, yeah. What did I say? Masoretic. The Masoretic is the standard Hebrew text which develops down through the Middle Ages and is the official Hebrew text used by Judaism today. It just so happens that on this passage that you looked at, the Septuagint also has the word light. So that would support Allegro's argument, right, on this passage. That is that the Septuagint translators also had a Hebrew text which had the word light. Now, uh, however, before we jump totally to that position that, oh, let's go to the Septuagint then and restore all of these readings, we have to keep in mind that the Septuagint is in several versions which do not agree, and in some cases, the Dead Sea Scrolls agree with the Masoretic against the Septuagint. See, it's not consistent. This is all being sorted out now by scholars, very word for word, believe me. If you get the new RSV, and, and again, I'm not selling it, but it's one of the ones that does this, and I think the New Jerusalem Bible does this as well, they only put in the Dead Sea reading when they feel there's a weight of evidence, like in this case, that several sources point to this being the original reading. Then they put it in. They don't just put everything the Dead Sea has different from, because that would be going to the other extreme. You know, almost, well, all I care about is what the Dead Sea Isaiah has just because it's older. An old text can be very corrupt. How? Somebody corrupts it? gets hidden away and it's very old and it's very corrupt. <laughs> you understand? <laughs> Just because it's old doesn't mean it isn't. By corrupt I mean different from the original, interpolated, things added, things taken out and so forth. Uh, Mr. Rushing? Yes, sir. I don't have the... Uh, Handout? Okay, I'm sorry have, about that. I don't have the material before me. Right. But, uh, you said that the context affected the way that you interpret the slain of the side text. That's right. And my question is, is that if you take the standard reading that was given later about the Messiah who will slay someone, how does the high priest shall order fit into that context? Now, you want to know about the standard reading that, that the Messiah would uh, kill somebody? Okay, I got your question. Yeah. How does that high priest shall order? Right. Now, as you're wondering whether it may fit better the other way, yeah. Um, Professor Vermesh, who is the champion of the alternative new, you know, other interpretation that it's not a slain messiah, but a slaying messiah. He's from Oxford, and it's in the latest issue of Bar. He doesn't deal specifically with that question. But to help him out a bit, and at least in that article, I shouldn't say he doesn't deal with it anyway, there is a, another text that, in the scrolls which quotes Isaiah 11, which has a phrase saying that the high priest will teach the Messiah what to do. It's the idea that the Aaronic priesthood will instruct the king. And so it could be speculated, and if Vermish hadn't thought of this, you know, I could offer it to him as, you know, I, I'm wanting to be fair both ways, that what that says is, let's take his view, the Messiah kills the evil one and the high priest judges and orders what needs to be done next or something like that, you know. Remember, we just have a phrase. We don't know what, what, what he does. Uh, but uh, that, it, in my uh, response, I, I point out your very, you know, argument as a counter-argument. In other words, I think your question, I would be more on the side of your question. Uh, what, source, I, what source shows that the high priest teaches the Messiah? It's in the Dead Sea Scrolls and uh, it's the commentary on Isaiah. 
And it's in Vermish if you want to get Vermish. Yes, sir. I recently purchased a book here at one local bookstore. It said Jesus and the Riddle of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And it's, it, 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 it says the Dead Sea Scrolls are written in Aramaic. The gentleman said it also. Yeah, some of them are about half are Aramaic, right? And it says here that Jesus was not born in Bethlehem, he was born in, in, a, in right. the Queen's Cave in Juan right. Run. That's right. The Essenes are the mother of all present day Christianity. Yeah, right. Here's another book that I purchased three years ago at a local bookstore, the, the other Bible. Right. All the different, different texts were left out of the present day Bible. Yeah. Very interesting. Right. Okay, two comments. Uh, I'll start with the last. It's not so much that the texts were left out, meaning, oh, we don't want you to see them or we forgot them. They were uh, excluded and, this, and it was felt by the Christian church and by the Jews uh, for the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible that these books were, uh, he has this book with some of the other books like Enoch and the life of Adam and Eve and they're perfectly available. You can read them. But uh, if you buy that book or other books, Charlesworth has two volumes, a uh, very scholarly edition of all of them. They're called the Pseudepigrapha. But there's no, don't fall for anyone who tells you there's a conspiracy or they wouldn't let you see the true Bible. It was judged that these books were not up to standard, that they are valuable, they're historical, you can study them, but they're not thought to be scripture. Every group has to make decisions about what books are the holy books that we will consider as our authority and what books aren't. Now, all the churches don't agree. Uh, the Western churches don't agree. For example, if you're Roman Catholic, you've got 13 extra books that the Protestants don't have, right? So you're familiar with the phenomenon. On the first book, though, and I, I hesitate to uh, speak negatively of other colleagues, but in this case, I feel it's justified. I think Barbara Deering's book, which is being sensationalized now, is the worst book ever written on the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, it's absolutely horrible. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, I mean, I'm for free thought and all that, but the problem is a lot of people will read that and buy it and think, oh, there's some new secret thing and that that's the last word. And I think most of you, I recommend you want to read it. Uh, I hope you have the intelligence to see after about the first 30 pages. First 30 or 40 pages are kind of interesting. But then it gets into the most wild, unbelievably speculative stuff where Herod is in with Jesus and they're going to divide the world and it's just on and on with all this stuff and a dating system. So you ask me as a scholar, I mean, it's nothing against her personally. I've never met the woman. As a scholar, I think the book is absolute garbage. <laughs> so. Okay, that was direct enough, I'd say. Uh, yes. And that's why it'll, you'll all go buy it now. Doctor, <laughs> uh, so. the uh, Bible lists about uh, over two dozen books that obviously are lost to us now. Is there anything in the Dead Sea? Now, Hula, the. Oh, the Bible, okay. Bible. Like the lost books of Jasher and so, yeah, yeah. right, right, right. The War of the Lords, I could go on and yes. on, but there, there's over two dozen. Is there anything in the Dead Sea Scrolls that refer to any of these books at all? Do mm, you know, even know that? Enoch. Well, Enoch, but Enoch's never mentioned uh, in well, the Bible. No, no, but I mean, he's talking about how in the Hebrew Bible it'll constantly mention oh, I'm talking about the different books. lost books. I'm familiar with Some people. Yeah. I'm familiar with with also the books that, you know, it, it mentioned... I don't think there's any absolute identification. There is a very interesting text called the Genesis Apocrypha, and that's what we call it. It sounds like one of those kind of books mm -hmm. that retells stories of the flood and Abraham and so on. Uh, but to say one-on-one, -on -one, okay, uh, Second Kings mentions the book of Jasher, here it is, the book of Jack. No, we don't have that. So there's nothing in the Dead Sea. Not to my knowledge, but I don't specialize on that, so I'm not absolutely sure. But I, I don't think there is. Okay. Speaking of some of these lost books, so the pseudepigrapha that uh, Dr. Tabor has mentioned, edited by Dr. Charlesworth. Uh, we hope that Dr. Charlesworth will visit us here in Houston, if I can get Dr. Jones to put in a good word for us there. <laughs> uh, he's a good friend of Dr. Charlesworth. We will announce that to you if you're on our mailing list, if that's able to be done in the next three months. Let's see, do I have another eager question? Uh, here's a gentleman here who's on his feet. Let's, yeah, let's get, we have time for about three more questions we after this one. This doesn't have to do with the scrolls exactly, but would you, would you please comment on it? 
uh, Grant Jeffries claims that he found the original uh, manuscript of the Mission of Torah in Jerusalem that has Jesus' name in it by the, written by the Jews uh, these five times, but all the other manuscripts that they have run across have those names, uh, the name of, of Maimonides, Mishnah Torah. Mishnah Torah, I believe I'm correct. He's talk, no, but the Mishnah Torah is a book written by Maimonides. Is he saying, or is he talking about in the Mishnah? Are you sure? I'm, I'm, not I'm, I'm uh, personally not familiar with this uh, extravagant claim. Uh, but you'd have to clarify, the Mishnah Torah is a very famous work by Maimonides. I have not heard of any discovery of that, and if such a discovery were made, I assure you it would make the front page of the Times, you know, a, a manuscript of the Mishnah Torah that mentions Jesus. Uh, it could be that he's working with codes, which some groups have done, where they count letters, and they say every, for example, if you look in Genesis 49.10, the scepter will not depart from Judah till Shiloh come, and you take the first letters of each word in that phrase, it spells Yeshua, and it could be something like that, you know, where you have a little, see, it's hidden there, or something like that. But statistically, that will occur, right, in, in certain phrases, and it so happens that that's one of the more interesting places it does occur. If it's that type of thing, but I'm ignorant on that. I'm sorry I can't help you. And uh, you want me to run down Grant Jeffries? No. No. <laughs> yes, sir. Right. Yeah. What um, have the scroll scholars generally agreed on? That might be silly. Okay. To say, uh, on the dating of both of the messianic texts. Okay. Dating is a very interesting question. I'm glad you brought it up. I was going to talk quite a bit about it, but now I'll just encapsulate it. Um, he asked, uh, "How would you date these? You know, is there any majority opinion?" Well, on these, they're too early to even say. But texts like this are going to be almost impossible to date uh, because they're just scraps and fragments. If, if these are common era texts, if then they're it's more important. the big question on all the scrolls for many of us who deal with Christianity is: Are they before 100 years, 150 years before the time of Jesus? Or are they from the first century? And even the radiocarbon dating is not conclusive. Here's the problem: the community exists. This is archaeologically sound from at least, let's say, 160 BCE to the Jewish revolt, 68. Now, that's a long time, isn't it? That's over 200 years. Now, think of a church group, an apocalyptic group, any kind of religious group, having a social history, watching world events, thinking the end was near, interpreting this, interpreting that for 200 years. The Jehovah's Witnesses would be a kind of interesting example, but they're not even 200 years old. What are they, 100 years old? How many interpretations have they had? You know, World War I, World War II. So it's very difficult to say this text uh, in a 200-year period is from this decade or something. Now, I can't resist, even though our time is probably, I, I've just got to read you this. In the published texts, let me show you how hard this is. You'll be fascinated with this. Here is a text that I've never seen comment on. It's only in Gaster. It's not even in Vermish, and Vermish says it's too fragmented minute to translate. Uh, and I looked at it, and it doesn't seem all that fragmented to me. Listen to this. You date this text. Our temple has gone up in flames. The shrine which was our pride has been turned into rubble. No more within it do we smell the sweet savor of sacrifices? The men have trampled in the courts of our sanctuary and carried away all the sacred vessels. Jerusalem, which was once a joyous city, is given over to beasts. Her squares are deserted, her highways are desolate. Not even a pilgrim is on them. Now, date it. Now, here's the problem. It's either Babylonian captivity, 500... 86 BCE, or 70, one or the other, right, after 70. Or how about the time of Hadrian? Well, Hadrian, Anti I don't know, uh, Antiochus, okay, maybe, but would you really say the temple had gone up in flames and so on? It sounds really, if it was written a few days after Antiochus, maybe, but okay. 
So here we got this text. That's the problem. But the reason I find this very interesting, I think uh, this might, uh, my tendency is to push this more into the first century, mm -hmm. that this is a group living somewhere from the Maccabean period up to the first century that might have lived through the destruction of the temple and are lamenting it with great uh, uh, disappointment. And that's the problem with these texts. Some of them are very old before the time of Jesus. There's no doubt about it. Like the Manual of Discipline, I think everybody would say that's certainly a hundred years before or so. It's their founding document. It gives all their rules. But then you get these other texts. Wouldn't any apocalyptic group make observations on the events of the next 200 years? Do you know how dramatic the events were of those times? Alexander the Great comes in. The Maccabees come. The Romans come. You know, the wars and so on. And this is an apocalyptic group interpreting of course they're going to interpret. That's why I think this so-called slain Messiah text could be a reaction to something that's happening, just like this. So just to say, oh, they're all before Christ, they're all Essene, they're all Maccabean, they're a background to Christianity, but they probably don't have much to do with the Christian movement, I think is a position that uh, increasingly is difficult to take. I think we've got the history of a Jewish apocalyptic wilderness new covenant group that runs all the way through the period and is certainly making observations on their daily history. Because they got to go back to the drawing board. That's probably why we can't figure it out. We got a bunch of versions of their interpretations. I think we have okay. one more question here in the back. Uh, someone had their hand up a moment ago. Uh, yes, sir. In the back row, and then we'll do the one right in front of you. Who was the teacher of righteousness? <laughs> James. The problem with the teacher of right. Okay. The question is, who was the teacher of righteousness? Answer, nobody knows. The problem is, was it an office or was it a person? Uh, that's one problem. Uh, was there, uh, you know, the idea of the righteous teacher means the correct teacher, the uh, more hatzedek, the true teacher. Uh, he's been identified as every one that we can find of piousness from Onias in 171 BCE to John the Baptist to Jesus to James to everybody in between to just some unknown person that they like that we don't know anything about. And at this point, all the theories are there. Uh, so to say who it is, I, I don't think uh, we know, but we have to keep speculating. And also, you could add to your question, who is the wicked priest? And who is the liar? Because what we have in the scrolls are characters, and they act. And now if we have this text, we've got a high priest, by one interpretation, ordering that a Messiah be slain, right? So uh, it's very uh, difficult. I wish I knew. Uh, uh, I have my speculations, but I wouldn't put them in print. It'll give them to you. You think Five Paul was the man in the line? We have a question mm -hmm. here. Last question. It surprised you, I think. The community that you're talking about, this is coming from, were they destroyed in 70 AD when the Romans destroyed Jerusalem? At the same time, or did they carry on after? The, the, the settlement itself that we call Qumran seems to uh, be destroyed and possibly occupied by Romans because we suddenly get a lot of Roman coins with pagan images on them. Uh, around the year 68. And then it gets occupied by the Romans, maybe as a little fortress or an outpost or something, because the war is still going on. It was concluded in 70, right? Jerusalem fell. Yeah, but see, uh, they're wiping out villages all. The revolt starts in 66, so this is two years later. That's the coin evidence. Uh, but when you say, was the group wiped out, that also becomes an interesting problematic question, because what is the group? If you define the group broadly as messianic, apocalyptic, wilderness Judaism, right, which I tend to define it as, no, they were not wiped out because a group of them went up to Pella, the ones who believed in Jesus, and so you get branches of them and so forth. But effectively, they're wiped out, I think, of any kind of political influence or rulership or whatever. And one of the reasons is the Romans are very sensitive about apocalyptic groups that are looking for descendants of David. So uh, for that reason, I think these groups were 
really crushed in that sense. Uh, you know, the Romans did not want any more fooling around with this messianic business, right? So any group that said, oh, we think a ruler's coming or pretty soon we'll take over and God's going to come and do this and that. On the one hand, you could say, oh, they're a bunch of crazy fanatics. But when they start storing arms or getting a lot of people together, uh, even if they don't have arms, if they start saying, like, I could call 12 legions of angels right now and take this place over, uh, you might say, uh, by the way, 12 legions was a, a little bigger than the Roman army, so that quote actually has a point. Is that saying, I could call the heavenly army and beat the Roman army? Uh, if you don't know that quote, uh, ask somebody where that's from. But uh, they could even be against people like that because you could say, well, that's, that's like somebody in a sane asylum saying, yeah, I'm going to take over you know, the government tomorrow by the magical power. But it also is the wor are the words of people who really believe things fervently and begin to get groups together. And for whatever reason, the Romans could say, we are not allowing that anymore. And so the Romans forbid all religious private associations under Trajan, under penalty of death. And Christians, even in Asia Minor, were arrested and killed for even meeting together. Remember that? In Pliny's letter to Trajan. They were executed. And the only question asked was, are you a Messianist? And if they said, yes, I'm a Messianist, meaning Christian, they were killed. And Trajan wrote back to Pliny and said, good job. Keep up the good work. We can't have these kind of groups. Uh, and that was in, uh, as I recall, Bithynia in Asia Minor. So the Romans are through fooling around with the Jews or any kind of groups that are into apocalyptic, messianic uh, nationalism. Let me say as we come to an uh, uh, ending here that we do have several scholars. I do see Dr. David Cakes here with us. He'll be here, a specialist in New Testament studies. Uh, Dr. Tabor will be here for a while afterwards. Uh, if you want to come up and visit, talk, ask questions, or give us some more information that we haven't yet considered. I want to thank all of you for being here today with us. We hope to see you again, and especially a, a real uh, thank you to Thanks. Dr. James. <laughs>